That was the week that was Frost on Friday, Frost on Saturday, Frost on Sunday, the David Frost Show, The Next President, the Guinness Book of Records, as well as a bunch of movies and other TV shows are just a handful of the credits of my next guest, ladies and gentlemen, David Frost. Welcome back. <laughs> nice to be back. <laughs> how, do you, how do you maintain even a semblance of sanity with the schedule that you keep? Even a semblance of sanity? Well, assuming that the semblance is there anyway, I think the, I think the thing is that I find that whatever the challenge is that comes up that really interests me, then I can find the energy for it. Do you know what I mean? New things come up, and I cannot tell you that I've got into new things with producing films, and I've got into new things recently with books and things, and I can't tell you really what I've given up in order to do that, but somehow you find the room for it. Do you know what I mean? I mean, now, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but I think it's something, that's what gives you the sanity. I think the adrenaline is what gives you the, the sanity. I nearly said insanity. <laughs> uh but living so much of the time in the air and in Australia and in New York and in, in England, uh, how is your private life affected or, or do you have time for a private life at all? I have time for a very, very vigorous private life, but the problem is keeping it private. That's the problem, really. It's the sense that the press are fascinated and so on for some obscure reason. I can always understand how, why I'm interested in my private life because I'm actually there to enjoy it. But. Uh, bewilders me why the press do and they uh, and you know there are restaurants that actually ring up and say who you're dining with and that sort of thing you've probably experienced the same thing and it's extraordinary there is there's a one PR man in New York for one restaurant that nobody ever eats at including him who goes around <laughs> to other restaurants and finds out who's eating there and says they're at his restaurant and so on you know I mean it's absolutely bewildering but I I don't think I've uh, I'm very lucky I think I've had the best of all possible worlds I've seen so many of your shows, your, your talk shows in the Guinness Book of Records on ABC and so many of the others, uh, and, and I really like them. I, you, have, you go to each new project with a great freshness that, that really appeals to me. How, what was the famous, the best to you, the best interview you ever did? I think the most chilling was with a Nazi war criminal called Bolde von Schirach. That was the most chilling. The most moving was with the Irishman, the author of Down All the Days, uh, Christy Brown, who learned to speak at the age of 18 and was thought to be a total paralyzed vegetable to the age of five when he learned that he could move his left foot and people suddenly realized that maybe he had a mind and that he, could, he learned to type and to paint and to write with his left foot. And that was the most moving, perhaps. And in terms of leadership, I think perhaps the most exciting leader in the world today is Gough Whitlam of Australia in many ways. But I think in terms of leadership, I'll never forget the interview I did with the late Robert Kennedy, which it seemed to me there were subjects in that conversation that he introduced that have almost disappeared from the national dialogue since. Are you different on camera uh, for the shows you do in Australia or Britain and the shows you do here in the United States? Is it a different David Frost? Or? I don't think so. Only just the vital thing, of course, of language. I mean, you've got to be very careful with language because in simple negotiations there are words that are different in the two countries. For instance, if you table a point in England, it means you put it on the table to discuss it. Oh. If you table a point here, you put it to one Postponed. side not to discuss That's it. That's right. Know? And uh, I remember the very first show I did here. That was the week that was. Um, I said to a guest on one of the early shows a phrase that would be a great compliment in England. I said, congratulations, your piece went like a bomb. <laughs> and his face dropped, of course, you know. And I remember discussing it afterwards with the dear late Randolph Church, and I was discussing this difference that bomb was a disaster in America and uh, and terrific in England and he's and Randolph Churchill said yes he said and they have another phrase for disaster in America to lay an egg now he said I'd have thought that laying an egg was a good and natural thing for a hen to do, but not over there in America. <laughs> and there are English ladies who come here to New York and, you know, call the bell captain and say, knock me up at eight o'clock in the morning. You know, now they don't... <laughs> they don't expect that sort of room service, but, you know, that's not what they mean. What, what about your other projects as producer? That's, that's relatively more recent than you as a talk show host. I, a film I did about a fantastic man in Calcutta. I think I would look back, not a, not a theatrical movie, you know, but there's a man in Calcutta called the Major Dudley Gardner, his name is. 
and he works for Salvation Army in Calcutta, which is dreadful. I mean, Calcutta is the worst place the on God's earth in which the pits in which to live. And he, for years, has been there seven days a week, providing food in the morning for people who don't have enough food who come to the Salvation Army hostel. And in the afternoon, he goes on a food run that's one of the most wrenching experiences I've ever had. And you go on this food run, and he goes to a kid with no legs who's sitting on top of a garbage tip, and then to a lep leprosy family who can't move out of their house and so on, and feeds them. Now, in the context of all this, he does all this with gangrene that started a couple of years ago in his left foot, and he will not stop. He's determined to go on. And there is a form of courage that is even more than all of that, which is that he's not sure that he believes in God. He's not a simple member of the Salvation Army, so he doesn't have simple faith to carry him through. Uh, he has a sort of, he's slightly a doubter. And also at the same time, he admits after 12 hours a day, every day, with never a day off, that the terrible thing about his job is that at the end of the day, it's lonely and it's boring. Now, Normally, heroes in the world today are people who are carried forward by the glow in their eyes, by their zealotry, by what they believe in. Do you know what I mean? But a man who does a heroic job and admits that there's a grinding boredom about it. I mean, that seems to me to be heroism on an incredible scale. And they call him, they say in Calcutta that there are two saints, Saint Teresa and Major Dudley Gardner. The angel with the bushy beard, they call him. Which role do you prefer, that of producer of documentary films like that or as host of a TV program yourself, as being the on-camera talent? I'd, th I'd suffer withdrawal symptoms if I gave up any of them, totally, I think. I love variety with a small v. Okay, I want to talk about some of your future projects, some more of those past funny stories. And Good Night America continues right after that. <laughs> My guest tonight is David Frost, famous TV host and producer who used to be a professional soccer player, or at least you were offered a contract. Oh, yes, that was one of the great thrills of my life. But then you're a, as is that fly, right? <laughs> very exciting fly. But, I mean, you're a great soccer player, too, around well, Yeah, but soccer's such, such a great sport, I think. And uh, when I was, I was just about to go to Cambridge University, and I was offered a contract as a professional soccer player, and I would have had to give up Cambridge, and they had a fantastic thing in England in those days. They had a maximum wage. So you've got people who are national heroes, like the great baseball players or football players here, and they were not allowed to be paid more than $30 a week. $30 I a mean, week. it was like the old-fashioned slave conditions, you know, or uh, in England, the surf conditions of the 19th century, you know, in the mill towns or something. I mean, it's incredible, a maximum wage. And uh, the combination of giving up Cambridge and that kind of put me off the idea, but I, but, of course, since then, one's played in charity matches with some of one's childhood heroes, which is, which is terrific. So how'd you get into television? I mean, after turning down the soccer career? Well, I went to Cambridge, and that's where I started doing television while I was at Cambridge for Anglia TV in Norwich, which my father, who's a Methodist minister, I think he thought it was Anglican TV. He thought it was some <laughs> sort of church foundation. And that's where I started doing television. And, uh, one, and then, of course, that was the week that was. I was very lucky. It happened very soon after I left. After I left. And, you know, and that had a sort of extraordinary I mean it got on the air in England that was the week that was came here you know after it'd been on the air in England and it got on in the air in England by mistake really because the BBC looked at this program threw up their hands in horror and said never but in the middle of this program there had been a confrontation between a very bright English journalist called Bernard Levin sort of man you love to hate with a group that he opposed and this became a regular part of the program every week he'd take on a group and in this pilot preparation program he took on a group of conservative ladies with their big flowered hats and things saying bring back flogging and you know and where's <laughs> very know, enlightened, all, uh, like enlightened group <laughs> and uh, he was face to face with them and they got so furious that they complained to the BBC that they were treated badly. Someone higher up in the BBC had to see it in order to reply to the Conservative Party, loved the show and put it on the air. So without those Conservative ladies' complaint, this revolutionary uh, show would never have got on the air because these women kept saying things that they never realized how double meaning they were. They would keep screaming at Bernard Levin because Harold Macmillan was Prime Minister then. They would keep screaming at uh, Bernard Levin Mr. Macmillan has always satisfied me. 
<laughs> quite unaware of the interesting implications of that remark, you know. Mr. Levin, how would you like your daughter to be taken along a dark street at night and nothing done about it? <laughs> Leaving out completely the thing in the middle, you know. I mean, absolutely extraordinary. And they would keep giving, keep giving Bernard Levin points and they'd complain and that was the result. Because, of course, we were very lucky in those days because this great man, Harold Macmillan, was the Prime Minister of Britain and he, he used to say superb things. And he had this terrific thing about Harold Macmillan that He'd say marvellous things, but his movements were always slightly out of sync with what he said. I always remember going to see him once and he said, Ladies and gentlemen, we must stand firm. <laughs> it's like a, a, a you, chief executive very close to our own heart. Uh, your own heart, <laughs> of course, yes. I mean, he would always say, he'd say, people have come here today from the left and from the right, from near... <laughs> and from far. You know, he always says, Marvel said, he once said, there is no housing shortage in Britain today. It's just a rumor put about by people who have nowhere to live. <laughs> you used to ask a lot of people on your talk show for their, it was kind of your, uh, the David Frost question, your definition of love. I wonder now if I can ask you. First of all, how does it feel being asked the questions instead of asking the questions? I like is it, it easier actually. or harder? Well, you have the experience, I'm sure, too. I think it's terrific because it keeps you sharp for both sides. Do you know what I mean? I think uh, I can sit here and thinking, now, what the, what's that old devil around <laughs> trying to get at or something like that? You know what I mean? And likewise, the other way around. Um, I like the experience. I mean, I, the, I, think it's, uh, I think it's more or less... I mean, it's particularly with someone like you where the thing goes back and forth. Do you know what I mean? I've had experiences sometimes of being interviewed by people where you know whatever you say they're not listening, you know, they're, they're thinking of the next question. I remember once saying to someone, and then of course, um, and then of course I married the Pope's first wife. And he said, but what do you think about the common market? Do you feel that Britain, you know, I mean, you knew you could say anything, you know, because, you know, the guy was so concerned about the next question. But the, so I like the experience, really. Now, I asked a lot of people for their definition of love. Someone went, uh, and, uh, I mean, Hardy Shaw said, love is a dialogue without end, I remember. Uh, and uh, Truman Capote said love means not having to finish sentences. <laughs> the, um, I don't know whether that was a reference to jail or what, but the, uh, uh, at the same oh, time, I, I don't know wasn't. which, I don't know which, there were some very good, then there were people, one, someone said, love is twin solitudes that respect one another, someone said, a very lonely answer that was. Um, twin solitudes. That's, twin that's twin good. solitudes that I meet like and respect one. one another. I don't agree with that at all. Uh, someone else said, love is staying awake all night with a sick child or a very healthy adult. <laughs> Which I think that, that's a good, <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good definition. What's yours? I think I'd say, I mean, I guess love is really when you're really more concerned about the happiness of the other person than your own, I guess. It's uh, all the other things that are vital, like desire and, and friendship and those things too. But I mean, the I guess it's that. I think I'd go for Well, that. I think that's a fine one. Thank you for coming on. You're I've, a really interesting guy. Well, not, not in, exactly in reference to the last question, but I've loved it. <laughs> Good. Yeah. And definition of that is the... the <laughs> we'll be back uh, in a moment. <laughs> right. Oh, you will. <laughs> we will, right. The man who discovered the string bikini will be with me, and some of the women who ah, made it... that's another definition of love. Yeah. The string bikini. Yeah. Sex. Uh, yeah. I, I, I was trying to think of, you know, after I asked you that question, I was trying to think of my own definition Yes, what of love. would yours be? I don't know. I really don't know. I think it's, the, it's a beautiful feeling that, that, uh, that somebody makes me feel. I, uh, I just can only define it that way. It makes, I, I stop thinking about so many other things, the complicated things in the world, and just kind of narrow it down just to one little thing. And it... Someone else said, love is never putting off until tomorrow what you can do today, because if you enjoy it today, you can always do it again tomorrow. Which is another <laughs> So well, let's do this again. All right, done. Okay, my friend. Okay, the string bikinis, when we come back. Thank you for being here.